Facebook Live and on behalf of Alice Laura, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome Foundation, the SADS Foundation, where our whole purpose is to stop SADS and to help families live and thrive despite their diagnosis of a genetic heart rhythm disease like long QT syndrome, Brugada, CPVT, and others. Welcome. We know what's on your mind and we are trying to meet your needs. And so we're so glad that you've chosen to join us today for uh, this fourth uh, Facebook Live session in the setting of COVID-19. We're right in the midst of it. We're in month four of the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm really excited to have a dear friend of mine and one of our scientific advisors for the SADS Foundation, Dr. Arthur Will, to join me and us today uh, to field your questions. Uh, Arthur is from the Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, Arthur, welcome. It's great to have you. And maybe you, give our listeners a, a brief bio sketch of who is Arthur Wilda anyway? Okay, so, so my name is Arthur Wilde. I'm a cardiologist in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And we started um, very early at the time that the genetics were unraveled for the arrhythmia syndromes. We started uh, working in this field. I, work, I, I saw patients before that, but I, uh, the, the interest um, became very uh, much at the time of the genetic uh, revolution in our field. So that is almost 25 years from now. Uh, I know Dr. Ackerman, I think about 20 years now, Mike, early 2000s, and, um, and we have done quite a lot of things together with, with great pleasure from my side. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And I think um, from my standpoint, uh, Facebook Live may not know it, Arthur knows it. He is one of, from my perspective, the absolute giants in our field of genetic cardiology. And besides that, he's a great guy. So Arthur, it's great having you. And, you know, last week, you and your research team published an incredibly important paper, timely uh, paper about our families, our patients who have uh, long QT syndrome or CPVT or any of our genetic heart diseases that we think about and that we're passionate about. And what does this whole pandemic of COVID-19 mean for them? This article was published uh, in Heart Rhythm uh, last week. And uh, Arthur, before we field the questions, maybe I could ask from your perspective, the highlight reel. So if I have long QT syndrome, uh, what would you say are the three most important considerations that you would want our long QT families to know from your article last week? Yeah. Thank you, Mark. These are the, the issues that we discussed in this paper. Uh, we start writing it after a Friday with at least 20 phone calls from patients and colleagues uh, uh, who were concerned about their condition and the, and the eventual uh, relation with the COVID-19 uh, um, uh, disease. And uh, when you have long QT, I think the far most important issue is the drugs that are proposed for treating a patient with a um, severe form of, of COVID-19. I don't think everybody who has a COVID-19 infection or SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, does need medication. But if the disease gets worse, um, you maybe propose medication which, which may not interact too well when you have long QT syndrome. So I think the most uh, and far most important issue in long QT syndrome is tell your doctor before he or she wants to start any medication that you have long QT syndrome uh, and that when the medication is still needed that they seriously make a baseline EKG before starting the medication and follow that very accurately on medication. And don't the you other think issue Arthur, is, yep. that, Arthur, don't you think there that the good news for our families out there is like you said, most of us, if we get coronavirus too infected, we're gonna be symptom free or have just minimal symptoms and we yeah. don't need any treatments of any sort. That, that is that is the case indeed. That, that is estimated to be at least 80%, maybe even 85% of individuals who are infected by the virus will not have any symptoms or only minor symptoms that don't need any treatment. So that is the, that is the, the important thing to realize. And, and only for the, that 10, 15% that really need treatment, 
then it becomes important to, to make very clear that you have long QT syndrome. And I think we'll come back to those potential treatments which you're referring to that could be dangerous to our long QT patients, particularly hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin. But before we do that, you had some really important messages for our families with Brugada syndrome. Uh, what would those most top of mind items be that a Brugada patient better have their 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 ducks in 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 order as yes. they say? In, in Brugada syndrome, it is not the medication and none of the medications that are uh, being proposed in uh, for COVID nineteen uh, interact with the Brugada uh, substrate. In, but in Brugada, the fever is the most important. So the one and, and foremost thing to do is to reduce body temperature with whatever medication you have available for that and do that right away at the time you have fever. We do believe that in particularly patients with a sodium channel mutation, so the genetic basis for Brugada syndrome is, is quite often a sodium channel disease. Uh, and particularly those patients are at risk uh, at fever, and we actually advise those patients to contact their doctor at the moment they have fever so that the decision can be made whether or not to hospitalize you. There are many individual factors that matter here. Age is very important. When you are very young, the risk appears to be higher. Maybe when you're very old, the risk appears to be higher. Uh, men are more affected here than women. Um, when you have been hospitalized before with a given body temperature, uh, I, I speak in, in Celsius, degrees Celsius, you have to translate that to Fahrenheit, but I think it's about something where 100 degrees Fahrenheit is a value um, above which you should contact your doctor and, and try to reduce that body temperature. And certainly do so when you have a sodium channel mutation as, as the cause of your Brugada syndrome. And let's stay on fever a little bit, because I know some people are really uh, concerned and want some specifics. You mentioned 100 degrees. Fahrenheit about 38 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, are you advising your families to take their temperature morning and evening, for example? So we at, at Mayo Clinic, we're required to take our temperature morning and evening. Mine was 96.9. Uh, so I'm hypothermic, I'm cold. Uh, <laughs> No, we haven't done that yet. I, th I think it, it is not only fever. I don't think fever is the only symptom. It's it's a little cough. It's a little sore throat and things like that. And if that goes together, then I would definitely uh, monitor uh, body temperature. But if you don't have any other complaints, I don't I don't think there's any need to, to measure body temperature. But if our Brugada patient feels feverish and it's registered at 38 degrees Celsius or 100.5 Fahrenheit, you would advise them to take an antipyretic and anti-fever medication. And which one would you suggest? I saw some things raising a concern about ibuprofen that made us start to suggest preferentially acetaminophen or Tylenol. What yeah. work would you recommend? These are, I think these are safer, the, the two that you just mentioned. Ibuprofen is not bad in the setting of uh, of COVID-19 that has been proposed. I think there's no evidence for that whatsoever, uh, but it has more side effects. So ibuprofen is, a, is an effective way to reduce body temperature, but it has more side effects than the other drugs that you just mentioned. So I think they are preferable for only that reason, not because it worsens the disease. Right, I think that whole business about ibuprofen making COVID-19 worse was didn't have very strong legs of evidence under it, mm -hmm. like you said, and but maybe because acetaminophen has even lower side effects, certainly doesn't hurt the gut, that in general, if you have access to acetaminophen, which in the United States, the trade name is Tylenol, maybe take that for your fever. Yeah. Well, then let's turn our attention, Arthur, to what you wrote about in your heart rhythm uh, publication on patients with catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or CPVT. Is there anything that they need to do differently uh, than any of the rest of us, for example? I, I think in generally not, in general not, because there are no drugs that, at least not in the in the normal uh, uh, treatment of, of COVID-19, there are no drugs that adversely would affect the patient with CPVT. Fever doesn't really matter. It, it might be the whole stress around it that maybe um, uh, put the patient at danger. 
Um, we believe that the most important thing is to keep your medication for CPVT. So don't stop the beta blocker or don't stop flaconite if you're using that. Uh, and only if you're at the very end of the disease course, or if you're very, very sick, there might be an issue with medication. But that is that is highly specialized care. And I hope that the doctors treating you at that point in time will realize that they, in particularly short of void, epinephrine type of drugs that are used in that very final stage of of disease uh, that make may potentially worsen uh, the outcome but in, in general i think a cpvt patients the, the best advice would be keep your medication as long as you can thanks arthur and then you know your article didn't only cover the channelopathies or our patients with genetic heart rhythm disorders it also includes some important um, pieces of information for our families with genetic heart muscle disorders or the cardiomyopathies. Is there any of the cardiomyopathies where you think that cardiomyopathy and uh, coronavirus or COVID 2 infection could be, uh, ha be associated with a worse outcome? Or do you think it, the recommendations are similar for all cardiomyopathic hearts, whether HCM or DCM or, or ARVC? What are your thoughts on that? I think we didn't discuss that in the paper, but I think in general, um, any cardiomyopathy, as long as there are no real heart failure symptoms, uh, is not a big issue uh, combined with COVID-19. But at the moment, you have heart failure complaints, which which in general means that your disease is, is not in the early stages. Um, uh, then it might be an issue because the coronavirus itself might might get to the heart and worsen the heart function, um, reduce the heart function. So in those patients, then there should be uh, extra care. And and these patients really could benefit from social distancing and, and just trying not to get the virus. And are there... The, measure, the most effective measure is social distancing. And you mentioned to the for in your article, the importance of if our families with our genetic heart rhythm diseases do get infected, that they should be quickly connecting to us, whether it's a face-to-face -face or more and more a non-face-to-face -face video consult or teleconference, just so that we can help guide. At what, le at what point in time do you think a family with genetic heart, say long QT syndrome, ought to contact their personal long QT specialist if they get infected with the virus? I would think there should be a low threshold, uh, and particularly for reasons that, that you should be reassured in time, you should know when to go. So there should be a very low threshold for, um, for getting into contact with your specialist on these syndromes. And I, my experience is that general cardiologists are not that familiar with these syndromes. So you really need your, your specialist uh, on these particular syndromes. So uh, as I as I started with in in on that Friday two weeks ago, I had already twenty calls from patients and doctors who were concerned about the condition. They were one or the other way uh, affected with the virus, and they wanted to know what to what precautions they had to take in particular. So and I would have a low threshold for contacting. And don't you think a lot of those calls because we hear at Mayo Clinic and at the headquarters of the SAS Foundation about two, three weeks ago, the phones were ringing off the hooks and it really seemed to be timed when that paper came out saying that if you have quote unquote heart disease, that you are at much greater risk of bad COVID-19. Yeah. And we tried to get the point out there to say time out. Yes, long QT syndrome is a heart disease. Yes, CPVT is a heart disease. But it's not the heart diseases that people were talking about in that article. Do, would you want to add anything about your perspective as to whether our families are at any greater or lower risk of COVID-19 disease than, say, you no, or I am? I, I fully agree with you that, that the, uh, the, the terminology used, heart disease, uh, refers to mostly elderly patients with, with ischemic heart disease, with heart failure. Uh, and that is not the general young individual with an inherited arrhythmia syndrome. They are not at increased risk 
uh, the only thing is that you need to take the precautions that we just discussed. It's it's the drugs in long QT and it's the fever, the body temperature in um, in uh, Brugada syndrome. And, and I see one question on uh, whether pregnancy and CPVT is a special issue. I don't think it is. Um, it, it, it doesn't increase the risk. It is the same uh, precautions that we just discussed, whether you're pregnant or not. And, and Arthur's pointing out that the public chat is open for your questions. That was a great question. And, and he and I have about 20 minutes or so to field whatever is on your mind right now. And uh, we'll, we'll take the questions as they, as they come in. We have one, Arthur, about, we mentioned long QT, but there's a very specific form of, of I guess, higher risk long QT. And that is our families uh, who have long QT with deafness. And we call those individuals Javel and Lang Nielsen syndrome. Do you think that there's anything specific to them in, beyond what we already have said for our long QT families? Yeah. No, I, I don't think so, except that these patients usually have a long QTC interval to start with. So that in, in, in those, in them, it might be particularly relevant to avoid any medication that may further prolong the QTC interval. So I think you should be careful in every patient with long QT syndrome, but certainly in patients who already have a long QT interval to start with. And you have a long syndrome patients are generally among among the subgroup with the longest QT interval. Yes, so there's a great question from Celeste. So thank you, Celeste, that she says she hears and understands that she, as a long QT person, she's not at greater risk of getting infected with it than I am, but that if she becomes infected with COVID-19 uh, and she has long QT, will her COVID-19 be necessarily worse? And I think you said that quite clearly. No, there's no reason to think it will be worse, but there is the potential, depending on what treatments are being used, if we feel like we need to treat your COVID-19, that the treatment could in fact do the wrong thing, which is cause a treatment-induced side effect that could be uh, could be bad. So do you wanna expand on that? Yeah, I, the most important thing to, to emphasize here is that for none of the treatments proposed, there's any sound evidence that it actually works. Uh, there is some some idea that chloroquine might work. There is some idea that as it, as it might work, but there's no proof. So if if you have a long QT syndrome and you you know that the, the treatment might prolong your QT interval to to uh, to an extent that it may cause arrhythmias, you better not use it because I, I there's no proof for it that it's better for you. And don't you think that it really is it's going to need to be that careful risk benefit balance? No doubt. No doubt. So the, you, you put yourself at risk with using a treatment that has no proven benefit. And I think it's important to say, don't you, that um, at this point in time, it has no proven benefit. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these drugs might not actually work for yeah. COVID-19 and help. It's just that the proof is, the proof that a physician scientist like you and I need to see has not been provided yet. No, and there has been some attempts already for chloroquine in, in the 200 group patients. In, in, in two, in a group, in, in, in a trial with 200 patients uh, treated and, and it did not, outcome was not better. I just saw a question on hardware in your body. If you have an ICD or a pacemaker, does that increase risk? There's no need for that. What There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Yes, so, so again, the disease itself, whether it's being treated with medications or being treated with a hardware like an ICD or a pacemaker, none of that makes you at greater risk. How about this one from, um, Carolyn, she she has Brugada syndrome. She hasn't yet seen a Brugada specialist. And is there anything else she should worry about at this time besides making sure she gets the body temperature down aggressively if she were to have fever? Is there anything else you would be advising? No, I think that's the that is the main thing in Brugada syndrome. If you have Brugada syndrome and you are symptomatic, I would advise to go and see a Brugada specialist, even in these days. Hospitals are not closed for normal care. 
uh, there was a, a actually a situation here in the Netherlands that we saw almost half of the patients that we used to see with with cardiac problems. So we we raised some attention to that last week, and and unfortunately, patients coming again to the hospital. If you need cardiac care, hospitals are open for normal cardiac care. That might not be the situation in New York City at the moment, but throughout the country, I expect that there will be normal care. Uh, yeah, and I think I think that's an important point. Is that's going to be different for the for our listeners who might be in different parts of the world. Uh, it's a different answer. So, for example, here at Mayo Clinic, we have stopped all elective outpatient evaluations and only reserved it for those who have an urgent, semi-urgent issue. So, for example, a stable long QT patient, we're not seeing them for their routine follow-up. A long QT patient, on the other hand, whose defibrillator just went off last week, we might be seeing them pronto, but we're moving many to video medicine and video consults. And so that person with Brugada syndrome, uh, we could easily, there are many places that could easily arrange a video consult to at least get you moving in the direction of what are the important things. So see where you are, depending on what country you're in, what state you're in now, uh, as to whether the outpatient clinics are open for elective visits, routine outpatient evaluations, or whether right now the door is sort of closed unless you have an emergency. So we're, we're sort of right now in the door is closed unless there's an urgent emergent need to see a doctor in the outpatient setting. Yep. How about this one? Um, one of our, uh, Samantha, hi, Samantha. So she's asking, so the proof we're seeing with these drugs is more correlative rather than causative. I think that's a really good question, Samantha. And I think, you know, Arthur and I had planned to talk about what is the evidence or the lack of evidence about chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine uh, and the treatment of COVID-19. So Arthur, let's take a little time and actually talk about what is the body of evidence or proof uh, that is out there? Is it observations? Is it anecdotes? And how can we help the, the listener understand the kind of evidence that you and I, if we had the luxury of time, yeah. would like to be seeing before we said that drug has an indication for this disease called COVID-19? I, I think the evidence for chloroquine is, is particularly on uh, so what has been done is studies on nasal uh, swabs where they have the, the, the virus and the replication of the virus is um, the, the, the speed with it, with which that happens is reduced by uh, chloroquine. When you put chloroquine in the medium, this is all in vitro studies, so outside the human body. Uh, in those uh, studies, in those experiments, uh, what you see is that the virus replicates less fast. Now, the only trial that has been done in patients who were quite sick with COVID-19, they, they randomized a group of patients uh, to chloroquine, chloroquine treatment and, and placebo, and that, that did not make any difference. Now, you can make the argument that these patients were too sick um, for chloroquine to help, but a, a study at an earlier phase of the disease has not been done yet. And there are, I think there are several trials on the way, uh, and we will know in a few weeks from now uh, whether it, it is effective or not. But at this point in time, there's no proof that if you have COVID-19, that chloroquine will help you. And I think when you say chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, we're kind of referring to both drugs. Yeah, I think that is the same. That I'm not... But I'm not sure 100% which drugs have been used where, but I think for hydroxychloroquine, the same evidence is there in vitro, but uh, there are no data in, in, in humans uh, with the disease. And I think Samantha is wondering about correlation versus causation or proof. And I think that's stemming from in the United States. We've heard infectious disease specialists in New York, for example, claiming that hydroxychloroquine has been a game changer, that none of his patients who he's treated have ever had anything bad happen to them. Their COVID-19 is all getting better and better. So the public is hearing about these chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine success stories. And what would you just remind um, people about the difference between some of our anecdotal observations, which may be really true, 
but not necessarily the reason behind why that patient got better. No, that, that there are so many other reasons uh, in a particular patient or even in a group of patients that things might get better at the point in time. And, and it may be good to know that my hospital, which is one of the main academic centers in the Netherlands, is not using hydroxy or chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine at all because we don't think the data are strong enough to expose these patients to the potential risk, as we just discussed, of QT prolongation and arrhythmias. And would you agree that that potential risk of drug-induced QT prolongation, that's not just for our families who have a one out of every 2,000 person disorder called long QT syndrome. Yes. There's a lot of ways that a person's QT interval could be increased at baseline that may put them at risk. Yeah, I just saw data from France where they treated 40 patients with hydroxychloroquine and they monitored the QT interval very carefully and there was a significant rise at, at least 50, 60 milliseconds, which we consider dangerous. Uh, Dr. Ackerman and, and myself uh, in, in all these 40 patients. So, and, and if there is something else, you might be using other medication. You might have a low potassium, which is uh, if you have diarrhea, which is one of the other manifestations of this particular disease. And you put yourself really at, at, at risk. And, and, uh, and this is for normal individuals without long QT syndrome, but definitely with individuals with QT interval issues. And don't you think that if we get convinced that there really is benefit, if, then we may be wi more willing to accept and navigate around the QT side effect. But when the benefit is so unclear that the risk balance for your institution has said, we're not even going to use it. For our institution at Mayo Clinic, we have said, yes, we are using hydroxychloroquine right now but we are not using combination drug therapy of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin because both of those medications are potentially QT prolonging and potentially QT dangerous. So we're not using both at the same time, but in specific cases of patients, we have started to use hydroxychloroquine and we too are still waiting for what is that true benefit signal? Is it there? Yeah, and it's if you if you really need it, but that also holds for other medication. So outside the COVID epidemic, we are also using QT prolonging medication in patients with long QT syndrome. Uh, there might be some drugs that they really need. That can be an antibiotic, that can be an anti psychiatric drug, which which they really need. But you 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 do that with very accurate EKG control. And right. make EKGs, regular time intervals, and, and just see whether you can continue or not. I think that's a really important point, isn't it, Arthur? That, I mean, like you, we have a lot of patients who have long QT syndrome and are on a concomitant SSRI for their anxiety or depression. Those medicines are on the hit list, but we agree to do it together with the patient because we think the benefit is worth the risk. And so, in long QT, if we were to have long QT with concomitant COVID, it doesn't mean that we would never put a patient on one of these medications. It just means that we would need to proceed with great caution. Yeah. Okay, one question that comes back is from uh, KST, uh, CPVT and a loose leaking valve. You, don't, you are not at increased risk. That doesn't make any difference. Yeah, and, and we did mention, and I think we had Kayla come on late, but Kayla again is wondering about um, special considerations for pregnancy. And if that means that you're pregnant, congratulations. It is being a mother or father is the most amazing thing in the world. Maybe only topped by being a grandfather, which I am for 69 days so far. So let's talk about pregnancy and any of our conditions for a little bit. Any concerns? I don't think so. I, I, there is no real data on pregnancy in general um, for, with uh, combined with COVID. I think any, any serious disease is an issue, of course, when you are pregnant, but it, it doesn't make any difference whether you are long QT patients or, or CPVT patients and are pregnant and have this disease. Once again, you will be young and the, the risk that you have a serious um, outcome of the disease is extremely rare. So, and that doesn't, and pregnancy doesn't change that. Yeah, I think, thanks, Arthur. Elaine is asking a really quick question about these anti-malarial drugs like hydroxychloroquine and 
decreasing the cytokine storm. And Elaine, you're reading well. So there's two mechanisms of action. One is that maybe these medications make it harder for the virus to penetrate the lung cells or penetrate and get into the heart cells. The other is if they've already gotten in and have caused their destruction in the so-called cytokine storm, maybe as an anti-inflammatory medication, it can sort of suppress that. That's after all why we use hydroxychloroquine in our patients with inflammatory conditions like lupus. But I think the real question is gonna be, will these medicines work? Is there a sweet spot in which they work? If you're already intubated, maybe the storm is too much too late and hydroxychloroquine is not gonna have a good enough effect. Maybe if we introduce it earlier, we could make it harder for patients with um, uh, coronavirus to go on to COVID-19. And Arthur, I'm curious if you've observed, some people have suggested, isn't it interesting that our hydroxychloroquine treated patients who have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis don't seem to be coming down with uh, COVID-2 mediated COVID-19. That's too early. I think it's too early. I, I think that's too early to, to state that. Um, the number of individuals who are in the hospital now are, are rapidly increasing, but it's, I think it's way too early to say that this particular population is not uh, within that, uh, is not there as a subgroup or represented as a subgroup because they are using this drug. It, too it early. Be, I think for me it's proven that using it in a late phase doesn't work. Uh, using it very early is is we have no idea at this point in time and there might be some rationale to do that right I, and i think it's just too early but we're going to learn so much aren't we it's kind of interesting that the pace of research and innovation uh bc before corona is yeah. way different than the pace that you and i are witnessing right now i saw today there were already 250 papers on corona uh, within within two months. Maybe There's we one question on ARVC. We should briefly uh, address ARVC. Perfect. Um, ARVC was not in our paper. It I, I think ARVC is a, a as if if you don't have heart failure, you're probably not at increased risk. There's always some speculation that that uh, AR, part of ARVC is is inflammation in the heart. And when, when the COVID-19 gets into the heart, uh, you might have a, um, a increased risk of arrhythmias when you have ARVC. But my personal view is that that is, if you have a mild form of ARVC, I don't think you are at risk. If you have a severe form of ARVC uh, and have some degree of heart failure, you might really be at risk. And then, and then once again, social distancing is the best thing you can do to avoid being affected. Well, here's a question, Arthur, from Valerie. And I think when you, you and I read this question, we both want Valerie to be on our research teams. So Valerie is saying, any consideration of adding a drug like mixilatine to reduce the risk for long QT patients if a decision is made to treat their COVID-19 with a drug like chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine? Great question, Valerie. And as and, uh, soon as we can start hiring again, uh, we'll we'll have a job opening for you, but no, that's a great question. Arthur comments on that. Yeah, it is a great question indeed because what chloroquine does, it increases the QT interval, and mexilatin probably reduces uh, or potentially reduces the QT interval. So you might balance actually it. But once again, as long as there's no proof that chloroquine works, you're not going to take additional medication to to reduce something that that I I don't think you need. So I would right. still not use it, but it is a nice question. It potentially maxillotin might work to reduce it. I, I tend to agree. Right. And I think an important point here that we should emphasize as we're coming towards the close is we want to keep all of our long QT families and CPVT families and Brigada families uh, coronavirus uh, free for as long as we possibly can, because in a month or two, we will know the answer about these drugs from a, a, a body of evidence that we would be more satisfied with speaking about the results. So anything that you would want to make sure that all families uh, with or without long QT, with or without regatta, that we're all doing to try to make sure we stay virus free for as long as we can. 
Yeah, that is important, Mike. I, I actually advise that many of my patients, and some of them were in schools, and in the Netherlands, the schools are not closed. Uh, they are still open for for uh, particularly children from healthcare workers, and but school teachers who have long QT syndrome or who have Brugada syndrome uh, even more, I actually advise them to not to get to work but stay at home and and really, um, really uh, experience social distancing. And I think uh, I think we have to keep coming back to that because for all of the people who have joined us today, the longer we stay coronavirus free, the better. We'll know what the treatment options are if and when we become infected. If that infection is severe or are we the 85 percent where it's just trivial? And so none of these treatments matter because we don't need them. So the longer we can stay uh, coronavirus free, the better. So. Arthur mentioned stay apart. So social distancing, I've kind of replaced that with physical distancing, the six foot rule. So two meters, you can't quite see my hands apart, uh, two yeah. meters apart. Take your temperature. We do. I'm, I'm thinking, why not? Um, and that's as much. Oh, I agree. I agree. Why not? Yeah. And what do, what do you think about um, the face mask? In the United States, we're starting to see a recommendation coming out that if we're going to go out in public, particularly the grocery store. Everybody out there, I personally think the grocery store is the single most potentially dangerous place to be right now. So put on a mask if you're going to go to that grocery store and get your groceries. Stay away from people. I don't think it will make a difference in getting affected, but but what, what the main effect of a face mask is that if somebody is in the pre-symptomatic state of and having the virus, he or she will less spread the virus. So in, in that sense, wearing a face mask, mask makes a difference. Absolutely. So it's doing our part all together so that if I don't know that I have it, I have my face mask on. If the other person doesn't know that they have it, they have theirs on. Yeah, that's, that is the main reason. And, and But the other thing to mention is that as long as there is a, a, a significant shortage of, of the relevant, the real good face mask in the hospitals, you should not advise the whole population to have one. You can use uh, less sophisticated ones in, in daily life outside your house. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. We are issuing one mask a day for those of us in healthcare contact, um, but the CDC in the United States, so it's www.cdc.org, put out a really slick video, the US Surgeon General demonstrating how you can make your own homemade face mask and it's really easy to do. Let's see it. Arthur, is there any, before we let you go and wrap up, is there anything that you would want to make sure Long QT and CPVT and Brugada families are doing that they may not be doing or that you want to emphasize? I think we mentioned the main issues and I would summarize that Long QT syndrome, it is important to mention that you have Long QT syndrome if you come to the hospital and that the uh, the relevant drugs are, uh, are are not good for you, and chloroquine is one of them. Azathromycin is another one. In Brugada syndrome, it's fever. Body temperature is is the only thing that really counts, and you should reduce body temperature. And in CPVT, um, I think it's keeping your drugs in this stressful situation is the most important advice you can have. Great, Arthur. My summary. Great. So it's been wonderful to have Dr. Arthur Wilder with us. And if I could give a hand clap, everybody can who's watching, uh, thank Arthur for joining us. I, on behalf of the SADS Foundation, Alice, Laura, and I are so glad that you chose to join us. Uh, if you are finding value, tell your friends uh, to join us this Friday. We're going to do it again this Friday, I think at 1.15 p.m. Central Standard Time. And joining me on Friday will be Dr. Elijah Bear a genetic cardiologist and a good, good friend of Arthur and mine from London, and will help us uh, have a perspective and field your questions, seeing what they're seeing, because at least in Europe, the epicenter has shifted over to the United Kingdom, and they're right in the midst of it. We, yeah, uh, the president is hospitalized at the moment. So and the president is, is in the hospital and, and recovering, thankfully. So. First question should be how the prime minister is uh, Friday. Right. 
And I don't know if you saw it, Arthur. Did you see the uh, message of encouragement from the Queen of England yesterday? Yeah, from I did. I did. Yeah. That was, was actually quite nice. yeah. that was actually quite special. My wife and I are watching The Crown, mm -hmm. and uh, which is about uh, the royalty, and so to see the Queen, I must say it was rather majestic, and I enjoyed uh, seeing her. and And I hope I have the ability to even say words when I'm 93 or whatever age uh, the queen is. So it was quite beautiful. She was quite graceful and elegant. So uh, Elijah Bear will be joining us all uh, on Friday. So let your friends know to join us. In the meantime, stay well, stay safe, stay physically apart, but socially stay deeply, deeply connected. And if you're wondering, I got to show you. Let me see if I can do it. Oh, Arthur. Yeah, yeah. And we, we have a few minutes. Let's see if the audio works. Hi. Hi. Can you say hi? Yeah, hi. Do you say hi? Hi. Okay. <laughs> so, so you heard us saying, you heard us saying a fourth. Chloroquine, if you are a long QT patient. <laughs> a boy chloroquine, but she has at day 67 said her first words, hi. So we say hi to you and goodbye. And thanks so much for joining us. Arthur, thank you. Stay well and uh, we'll connect real soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye.